Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, this week's health stats show that almost two in three patients attending accident and emergency at Glasgow's Queen Elizabeth University Hospital were not seen within the target time. In just one week, more than a thousand people at the Queen Elizabeth alone were not treated within four, years, eh, four hours. All over Scotland, the number of people waiting beyond the target time was over 9,500. It is the worst ever performance in Scotland's a and &E departments. So what specific actions is the First Minister taking to prevent people waiting hours on end at accident and emergency departments over Christmas? First Minister. Firstly, presenting officers specifically in relation to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow, obviously it faces the same challenges as other hospital sites uh, do and the performance there as it is in hospitals across Scotland is not where uh, we want it to be and certainly not where patients uh, have a right to expect it to be. That said, the most recent statistics show that performance at the Queen Elizabeth it had improved. Uh, however, we know performance will fluctuate um, and indeed for the national picture as well as for individual sites, uh, the monthly figures give a, a clearer depiction of uh, performance. Uh, in terms of the Queen Elizabeth specifically, through the overall uh, unscheduled care collaborative, uh, that hospital has a range of actions underway, including opening additional wards on site, uh, reconfiguring their surgical and medical capacity balance. Uh, they are also uh, working to improve performance in the minor injuries uh, flow for patients who need care but not necessarily admission to hospital. And uh, they are optimising their discharge process by rolling out discharge without delay with the potential uh, to see an additional two to three discharges per ward per day. So there is intensive work underway at that hospital. And indeed that reflects some of the work that is underway across Scotland. Uh, these, uh, this situation, of course, uh, is of concern to me, to the government, and we're working hard to address it, supporting the health service. Of course, it is not unique to Scotland. We are seeing the same pressures in health services uh, in all parts of the UK and indeed further afield. Uh, but we will continue to take the steps uh, to support the NHS to address these issues here in Scotland. Douglas Ross. I, I know that the First Minister was focusing on the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is what I was asking about, but I was also saying these are the worst statistics on record for A&E departments across Scotland. And I think people watching this would like to hear what the First Minister plans to do across Scotland at this critical period we're leading up to over at the Christmas holidays. But let's look at other departments within our hospitals beyond A&E, because the First Minister it did mention discharges. The number of beds occupied because of delayed discharge is also at its worst ever level. In the most recent month of data, 1,900 beds every single day were taken up at Scotland's hospitals by patients who had medically been cleared to leave. They could safely go home, but instead they are occupying beds. First Minister, if the Scottish Government had kept its promise to end delayed discharge, wouldn't we have 1,900 extra beds to treat patients right now? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, President Officer, I want to, uh, as quickly as I can, go through uh, all of these points. Firstly, yes, I did concentrate on the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in my previous answer uh, for the simple reason uh, Douglas Ross asked me about the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. However, I also referred to the Urgent and Unscheduled Care Collaborative. That is a national initiative. It's backed by £50 million pounds of investment that is supporting the implementation across Scotland uh, of a range of measures to uh, drive down weights in our accident and emergency units. And they include uh, offering where appropriate alternatives to hospitals, such as hospital at home, uh, directing people to more appropriate urgent care settings, scheduling urgent appointments to avoid long waits in accident emergencies. So the examples I gave in relation to the Queen Elizabeth, as I said, uh, reflect that wider national work. It, I also made the point, and I think it is uh, worth uh, repeating this point, that while these are very serious issues in Scotland that this government is extremely focused on addressing, they are not unique to Scotland. If you look 
at the situation in England right now, more than 10% uh, of patients going to E&E are waiting over 12 hours. Uh, so this is an issue that health services across the UK and much of the world uh, are facing right now, and we continue to focus on them. Turning briefly to delayed uh, discharges, uh, of course, ag again, this is a problem replicated across uh, all health services uh, in the UK right now. Uh, of course, not all uh, delays are in the acute sector, and it's important to point out that uh, in terms of the most recent year for which we have data, 97% of all patients are discharged without delay. Uh, but we are taking significant steps, working with health boards and integrated joint boards to target investment this year. Uh, so that includes investment to enhance care at home, to increase the hourly rate of pay for those who work in social care, uh, to support interim care arrangements and investment to enhance multidisciplinary teams. There is a Briefly, First Minister. assurance uh, I will be as brief as possible. This is important stuff, oh, Presiding Officer. Serious questions have been asked, and I'm seeking, yes. I'm seeking to give detailed answers. The final point I want to make is that a ministerial... I would have thought, having raised these really serious yeah, issues, exactly. the Conservatives would actually want the information that answers the questions. Even if they don't, I suspect people watching at home do. Final Briefly. point is that we have established a ministerial assurance group to provide advice on the deployment of options that support the resilience of the health and social care system in response to winter pressures. That group is currently meeting weekly. Douglas Ross. Well, I, I think the concerns from these benches were the First Minister apparently disrespecting the presiding officer, who is asking, who is asking to focus on the issues. And, and perhaps, perhaps the First Minister would have more time to focus on the issues about the questions on Scotland's NHS if she didn't try uh, to uh, throw the blame elsewhere around the United Kingdom. Because the unique issue here is Nicola Sturgeon and her government are in sole control of the NHS here in Scotland. So I've asked about the problems in our A&E. I've asked about the issues with delayed discharge. So let's look at another issue that is happening in a part of our NHS where patients are really struggling to get treatment, our GP practices. This week, Dr Andrew Buist of BMA Scotland said this. These are his words. My real fear is we are at a tipping point and what we're going to see is areas of Scotland that are under-doctored. He continues, and that is more likely to happen in areas of higher deprivation and the care of these patients is going to suffer. First Minister, are doctors right that if you're poorer, you'll receive a second-rate healthcare service in Scotland's NHS? First Minister. Uh, a great deal of what this government does in the health service and more generally, of course, is designed to tackle and address inequalities, not least the steps we are taking through our social security system yeah. uh, to lift people out of poverty uh, and indeed to mitigate the actions of a Tory government at Westminster that is pushing so many more people yes. into yeah. poverty. But on the NHS, uh, presiding officer, I was giving, uh, as I think is right and proper, uh, detailed information about the actions this government is taking to address challenges that our NHS is facing. I was making the point, and I think it is an important point to make, uh, that these challenges are not unique uh, to Scotland. Uh, they're not even unique to the United Kingdom right now. But if Douglas Ross wants to say this is all specifically about this SNP government, then, then, then OK. Notwithstanding the challenges that our NHS is facing, A&E units in Scotland are the best performing anywhere in the UK. Delayed discharges... Delayed discharges, while far too high, are lower than they are in England and Wales. And on, and on GPs, which I'm going, to, I'm going to come on to the question about GPs, there are more headcount GPs per 100,000 population in Scotland than the rest of the UK by some considerable distance. So if Douglas Ross is saying uh, that the challenges in our health service are all about the SNP, then he has to recognise the relative performance of our NHS compared to other parts of the UK. On GPs, uh, again, we are working 
to increase the numbers in our National Health Service. We have record numbers across uh, many different clinical areas uh, already in our health service. We are working to increase the number of GPs. Uh, we've already increased headcount by uh, 277, and that positive progress working with the GP profession will continue. And of course, uh, we are recruiting and supporting the recruitment uh, of other professionals to support multidisciplinary teams in primary care. Final point I would make, presiding, presiding officer, is this. Uh, it is easy um, and it is entirely legitimate in uh, this session or any session of First Minister's questions to state the problems in our National Health Service. Uh, but the job of government is to take the actions to support the NHS to address these issues. And that is the responsibility that the people of Scotland trust this government to do. Douglas Ross. I think it's shameful that the First Minister dedicates more of her time attacking the NHS in other parts of the United Kingdom than focusing on what she can do here in Scotland. Because it is absolutely clear that more has to be done to tackle the crisis in Scotland's NHS. There's a crisis in our A&E departments. There's a crisis with delayed discharges. There's a crisis at GP practices. And all of this adds up to healthcare that doesn't deliver for patients. For cancer patients, the situation can then be between life and death. We've received a freedom of information response from a Scottish health board on this issue. It reveals that a patient has waited more than six months to start treatment for breast cancer. Another patient has waited 18 months to start treatment for prostate cancer. And worst of all, Someone has waited two years, two years to start their treatment for cancer. First Minister, that is not good enough. Lives are at risk. The longer someone waits to start treatment for cancer, the less likely they are to beat cancer. So what action will the First Minister and her government take to tackle these appalling waiting times? First Minister. Well, firstly, President Officer, there are few areas of uh, the NHS more important uh, than cancer care uh, for the reasons that, that Douglas Ross has set out. Um, and obviously he cited individual cases. As always, uh, I uh, am very willing to look at uh, the particular circumstances of individual cases. But it remains the case, uh, even with all of the challenges of the pandemic, that the median waiting time for a patient with cancer to start treatment uh, once uh, a decision to treat has been made is measured in days, yeah. uh, not weeks, uh, and certainly not months. Uh, well, the, it is, I'm, I'm trying to answer serious questions in a detailed uh, fashion, presiding officer. What I started saying is there will be individual cases, uh, sometimes where the clinical circumstances mean that it takes longer, and sometimes, yes, uh, where failings in the NHS mean that it takes longer. The point I am making is for the vast majority of patients that is not the case, and the median waiting time to start cancer treatment is measured in days in this country, uh, and that is down to the hard work of those on the front line. Now, presiding officer, uh, I think Douglas Ross started his last question by saying I spent more time attacking the health service elsewhere than I did talking about the Scottish uh, health service. Uh, a, I've not attacked the health service anywhere. Secondly, I think anybody reviewing the official report uh, of this session will see that that is just factually inaccurate. In fact, the Conservatives were getting impatient because uh, they seemed to think I was taking too long going into detail about the unscheduled care collaborative earlier on. But when, when Douglas Ross puts it to me that the problems in our National Health Service are unique to Scotland and they are worse in Scotland because of this government, it is reasonable for me to point out that that is not the case. Thank you. That despite the challenges that nobody here is shying away from, our NHS performs better than its counterparts in England and Wales. And the only reason I'm saying that is because Douglas Ross is putting the counter to me. Finally, presiding officer, it is really important that we continue to support record investment in our National Health Service. It is not that long ago, and here we are measuring in weeks, uh, not that long ago that Douglas Ross was demanding uh, that I cut taxes for the richest people in our country. Had I followed his advice, we'd have had to take investment out of our National Health Service, which is why few people will take Douglas Ross or the Conservatives seriously when it comes to trust on the National Health Service.
Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President Officer, child and adolescent mental health services are in crisis, and they have been since long before the pandemic. Uh, too many children and young people are having referrals rejected, and too many are waiting too long for treatment. Uh, does the First Minister know how many referrals to CAMS have been rejected in the past year, and how many children have waited more than a year for their first appointment? First Minister. Um, I'm certainly very happy to uh, give the precise uh, figures uh, to Anna Sarwar uh, later on uh, rejected referrals. However, um, while there are challenges in children and adolescent mental health services, as there are, and I've just been reflecting across the National Health Service, uh, we have in uh, recent uh, months been seeing some very positive changes in waiting lists, actually the most positive changes uh, for over half a decade. So the overall CAMS waiting list has uh, decreased in the latest quarter uh, by 1,398 children since uh, the previous quarter. Children waiting over 18 weeks uh, have decreased by 658 since the previous quarter, and children waiting over 52 weeks uh, have decreased by 281. And actually, uh, that marks the first time that there has been a decrease in all three waiting lists since September 2016. So there's significant work still to do, not least to continue our progress in community uh, mental health services for children and young people. But there is progress being made, particularly to tackle the longest waits, and I think that is something that should be welcomed. Anna Sarwar. Uh, 8,873 children and young people have had their referrals to CAMS rejected in the past year. 8,873. 1,248 had now been waiting more than a year for their first appointment. And the First Minister quotes statistics on those who have had their first appointment, but even those who have had a first appointment are still not getting the treatment they need. And here is just one example. Charlie is a primary seven pupil. He was referred to CAMS in January 2020. In April 2020, he had a video consultation with a doctor from CAMS, so would have dropped off the list referred to by the First Minister. But this is the last time he heard from CAMS. He's had no diagnosis, and without treatment, Charlie has become withdrawn and doesn't like to spend time with other children. His mother found a video he had posted to TikTok where he asked if anyone felt like they wanted to die because they were so different. Charlie's mum told the CAMS service but they said it would make no difference to his waiting time. They told her that it could be another two years before Charlie receives the support he needs. This is not good enough. Charlie is not alone. There are thousands of children like him. First Minister, how have you let it get so bad? First Minister. Well, before I come on to the, the general uh, issue again, let me uh, say, obviously, Charlie's experience is not acceptable. I, I don't know all of the particular circumstances of, of Charlie's case. As always, when individual cases are raised, uh, I am willing uh, to look into those. Uh, it is the case uh, that uh, there are waits for child and adolescent mental health services that are too long, uh, but it is also the case that there is significant action being taken that is reducing already these long waits. And, and I Sarwar uh, just uh, well didn't respond to uh, the information I gave him in my uh, previous answer, but it is really important. Nobody is uh, denying there is a significant issue here, uh, but we are now seeing uh, decreases in the numbers of children waiting over 18 weeks, the numbers uh, waiting over uh, 52 weeks as well, and the overall uh, waiting list is also decreasing. So does that say there is not still a challenge? No, it doesn't. But it does say that the significant investment, the increase in the workforce, is now uh, having uh, an impact where we need to see it and we need to continue that. In terms of rejected referrals, uh, we have already accepted all of the recommendations in the audit of rejected referrals uh, that uh, was published in 2018 and we continue to act on them. One in every two referrals to CAMS is actually seen within 10 weeks um, and of course health boards have a duty to prioritise uh, those that need to be seen most uh, quickly and of obviously where any experience doesn't match that, we of course uh, have a duty to, to look into that and learn from it. Finally, presiding officer, we are also seeing 
um, a significant increase in those uh, who are accessing community uh, support for mental health services, which is a, an important part of that. Local authorities report uh, that in the first six months of this year, more than 38,000 children uh, accessed enhanced community-based mental health support services. And that is important so that we can ensure that those who need specialist services get it more quickly. Anna Sarwar. The First Minister is just not listening. If you get a first appointment that is a telephone call, but your diagnosis doesn't happen and your treatment doesn't start, but you fall off a list, that's not a measure of success. That's a measure of failure and demonstrates you're gaming the system. This was a problem that is long before COVID. When Charlie's mother phoned CAMS, they said they were still waiting and working through cases from 2018. So that will be cases where they had the first appointment, but there will also be cases where treatment hasn't started and a diagnosis hasn't happened. And this government has never met its CAMS waiting time. And according to Public Health Scotland, a quarter of all deaths of 5 to 24-year-olds in our country are from suicide. A quarter. In the words of Charlie's mum, our children are being failed and no one is doing anything about it. But we can fix this. So will the First Minister first reverse the cuts to mental health in primary care, second, guarantee funding for schools-based counselling, third, commit to increasing the proportion of the NHS budget being spent on mental health so it reaches 11%, the same level as England and Wales, fourth, create a new referral and triad system for mental health so that no one is rejected, and finally, record and publish the true waiting time from referral to diagnosis and the start of treatment so that no child like Charlie is left abandoned. First Minister. Presiding officer, um, I'll say again, uh, because it is important, that experiences like Charlie's are not acceptable. And I don't know all of the circumstances, so I'm willing to look into that. And I'm not standing here and saying Charlie will be the only young person, far from it, in the country that has that kind of experience. Uh, but nor is it right to say uh, that the progress I have narrated today is somehow unimportant, because that is the progress that requires to be made to ensure that uh, there are far fewer experiences like uh, Charlie's. Uh, in terms of funding, uh, under this government, mental health spending has almost uh, doubled uh, in cash terms uh, since we took office, um, and we will continue uh, to support record uh, expenditure across our National Health Service and ensure appropriate expenditure for mental health services. Of course, as I said earlier on, uh, we are also shifting more treatment into the community. So one of the most important things that has been done, backed by investment, is the recruitment of counsellors across our secondary schools. These are really important issues. Uh, but issues again that uh, while it is right and proper to come to this chamber and state the challenge, our job, as I have demonstrated today, is to get on with the work of addressing these challenges. And as I have set out, uh, we've seen a fall in the waiting list for access to CAMS, um, and that's down to the investment and the actions that are being taken, and that's why it's so important that we continue with it. Thank you. I'll go to um, question number three, and we'll take constituency and general supplementaries after question number six. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, the Cabinet will next meet on Tuesday. Can I advise the Chamber one of the matters that Cabinet will discuss on Tuesday is ongoing monitoring of the strep A uh, situation. Sadly, as we know, a number of children in England and Wales have died from invasive Group A strep infections, and our thoughts will be with their families. While increased levels of infection have been seen in Scotland, uh, current numbers are not particularly exceeding previous spikes, uh, and we have had so far no deaths of children. Uh, however, a total of 13 uh, invasive Group A strep cases in children under 10 were reported to Public Health Scotland between the start of October and December the 5th. The uh, majority of these are mild, of course, and can be treated with penicillin. However, there is no room for complacency, and we will continue to monitor the situation very closely. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for that reply and I'm gratified to hear that the Cabinet will be discussing the Strep A outbreak. And can I ask that she comes back to Parliament before Christmas uh, with a statement on the progress on that issue? Uh, <laughs> Presiding Officer, what we've just heard from Anas Sarwar is devastating. Charlie is by no means alone, not by a long shot, and the situation is desperate. When Humza Yusuf launched the NHS recovery plan last year, the mental health treatment target was missed for one in five children. 
it's now one in three. Young people are battling the long shadow of lockdown, anxiety and depression without support. Now, Nicola Sturgeon is trying to persuade this chamber of progress, but £38 million has just been cut from this year's mental health budget. That is money that could have been spent on cutting waiting times, training staff and putting more counsellors in our schools. That but that cut will lead to more delays. Presiding officer, you only get one childhood and waiting month after month after month for help can shatter those formative years. The NHS recovery plan promised the eradication of mental health waiting lists by March. That was always a bold target, but it is barely 100 days away and things are moving backwards. So can I ask the First Minister, if that target is missed, will she continue to stand by this beleaguered health secretary? First Minister. Well, Briefly, presenting officer, uh, mental health spending has uh, doubled under uh, this government. Um, that is uh, a fact. Uh, the number of people working in CAMS uh, has also doubled uh, under uh, this government, um, up by 110% uh, uh, to be precise. There are significant challenges in waiting times for CAMS and uh, we take that extremely seriously. Uh, but it is right uh, to point to progress because it is progress that that investment and the increase in the workforce is designed to achieve. So again, let me point out, we have seen a 14.4% uh, decrease in the number of children and young people on the waiting list compared to the last quarter. Uh, we're seeing a decrease in the number waiting over 18 weeks uh, and the number waiting over 52 weeks. And as I said earlier on, that's the first time since 2016 that there's been a decrease in all three uh, waiting list measures. Does that mean we don't have more work to do? Of course it doesn't. There are significant challenges, uh, but there is real progress being made because of the actions, the focus and the determination of this government to support uh, the work of those on the front line. And that will continue. Question number four, Paul McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the rollout of the child disability payment. First Minister. Uh, we know that caring for a child who is disabled or has a long-term condition can result in extra costs from buying specialist equipment to taking part in activities. That's why child disability payment is a vital benefit that helps parents support their children to live their lives to the fullest possible. Um, I'm very pleased that in its first year, almost £60 million has been paid to the families of nearly 44,000 children and young people. Child disability payment is the first disability benefit anywhere in the UK where applicants are able to apply online, by phone, by post and face to face. And this demonstrates our commitment to improving access to social security and ensuring people receive the assistance to which they are entitled. Paul McLennan. Thank you. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? With increasing financial pressures on families in Scotland right now, it is even more important than ever that people get all the benefits they are entitled for. Can the First Minister therefore outline how our constituents can apply for child disability payment and check what extra financial support they might be entitled to from the Scottish Government? First Minister. Uh, well, it's important uh, that we do take steps to raise awareness of all of the help that is available and encourage as many people as possible who are eligible to apply for assistance. And as I said in my original answer, uh, for child, child disability uh, payment, applicants can apply online by phone, by post or face to face. I would encourage anyone who thinks they might be eligible for any uh, of our benefits to get in touch with Social Security Scotland staff are available to answer queries about benefits, help complete application forms uh, and of course there are local delivery officers available across the country so that this can be done face to face uh, where that is necessary. We are absolutely committed to making sure everyone gets the financial support they're entitled to uh, as shown through our benefit take-up strategy. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. When setting up Social Security in Scotland, the Scottish Government said that one of the things it would do would be to get decisions right the first time round, recognising the distress that redeterminations can cause. Figures show that of redeterminations requested for child disability payment, 86% of cases the decision was not right the first time round. We were promised a fairer system here, so what can the First Minister do to address this issue and bring certainty to people who need Social Security that they won't need to jump through hoops to get it? First Minister. Well, fe feedback from app applications uh, where the first decision is not made correctly the first time is part of the process of making sure uh, that system is improved on an ongoing basis. Uh, and that is work I know uh, that Social Security Scotland uh, takes very seriously and focuses very hard on. Um, for all uh, the issues that she absolutely rightly brings to this chamber, 
um, about the operation of the social security system, particularly as it affects people with disabilities. I am absolutely certain uh, that Pam Duncan Glancy, and I hope I'm not wrong here, uh, would share my view that we do already have a fairer system in Scotland around these things than elsewhere in the UK. But we have an obligation through Social Security Scotland to continue to improve that experience so that a, people are getting all the help that they are entitled uh, to and secondly they are getting that as easily as possible uh, and with as little bureaucracy as possible and where decisions are taken correctly in the first instance. Question number five, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how many single crewed ambulances responding to an emergency have been deployed in the last six months? First Minister. Between June and November this year, there were 1,429 instances when the Scottish Ambulance Service uh, single crewed ambulance shifts across Scotland. To put that in context, Presiding Officer, it represents 1.72% of the total number of shifts in that period. In addition to that, of course, there will be paramedic cars or motorbikes, which are routinely uh, single crewed. Uh, these are used to support the ambulance service multi-vehicle response to serious incidents, as well as being used by advanced paramedics to support patients with less serious conditions in the community. Uh, single crewed ambulance shifts only happen in exceptional circumstances uh, that can't be avoided, such as short notice staff absences or a significant uh, unforeseen increase in demand. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you uh, for that answer. That's really concerning because in simple terms, single crewed ambulances cannot transport patients to hospitals. In the Highlands, where journey times can be over two hours, this means there is a significant danger to life. Now, in 2008, First Minister, when you were the Cabinet Secretary for Health, you said the Scottish Government's policy is clear. Traditional accident and emergency ambulances should be double crewed with at least one member being a paramedic, unless there are exceptional circumstances. In too many instances, you went on to say, particularly in the Highlands, that practice is not living up to the, po the policy is not living up to the practice. It is clear after 14 years of inactivity, you have failed. Will you explain to my constituents why you have failed and when single crewed ambulances will be consigned to history? First Minister. I'm, I'm genuinely not sure that Edward Mountain listened to the, the no. answer to the first question. Uh, the commitment that was made in 2008, which I remember uh, very well because I was Health Secretary at the time, and at that time the instance of single crewing uh, was significant, particularly in rural areas and the commitment we made then to supporting the ambulance service with funding to eliminate the requirement uh, for rostered single crewing, uh, particularly in remote and rural parts of the country, uh, was achieved with single crewing now only taking place in exceptional circumstances that cannot be avoided. 1.72% uh, of shifts were single crewed in the six months uh, that I have been asked about and have talked about today, less than 2%. And let me explain uh, to Mr Mountain's constituents uh, why that is the case. If uh, there is at the last minute uh, a situation where a member of staff is ill and doesn't turn up to work, uh, for example, uh, as happens in any walk of life, the only alternative uh, to single crewing would be not to have a crew at all uh, and not to have the ambulance on shift. Uh, so it is only in those exceptional circumstances and less than 2% effectively in any national health service it does amount to eliminating uh, single crewing and health boards uh, sorry the Scottish Ambulance Service continues to work to minimise that figure as much as possible. Question number six Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on whether it will instruct Scottish Water to freeze water rates for 2023-24 to help with the cost of living crisis. First Minister. Decisions on the levels of water charges are matters for Scottish Water's board. Uh, their decision must be taken with due regard to the principles of charging for water services set by Scottish ministers, including the key principle of affordability. Uh, the board took a responsible view last year and held charges to a real terms freeze. We expect them to again take a proportionate position 
balancing affordability with critical investment needs to protect the quality of our drinking water and the environment. Of course, the average water charge in Scotland remains lower than the average charge in England and Wales, but we are committed to supporting people facing any issues uh, with paying their water bills, which is why, as part of our overall package of cost of living measures, we have increased the maximum level of the water charges reduction scheme discount from 25% to 35%. Jackie Bailey. Um, last year, inflation was running at about 4%. Under the formula agreed by Scottish Water and this government, water rates are charged at CPI plus 2%. Last year, the Scottish Government intervened and held water rates down, which is welcome. But this year, inflation is at 11%. The cost of water bills are set to increase by an eye-watering 13%. With an acute cost of living crisis, the worst in many decades, will the Scottish Government freeze water bills for the next financial year? First Minister, you have the power to do this. You intervened last year. The question is, do you have the political will? First Minister. Um, this is obviously a matter uh, for Scottish Water's board. As I, I said in my original answer, the, the board of Scottish Water uh, took a responsible decision last year and we would expect them to do the same this year uh, and to recognise absolutely the cost of living pressures uh, which remain very intense and acute. But we also expect uh, and require Scottish Water uh, to discharge other responsibilities to make sure we have a well-maintained water system so that the quality of our water services is high and it is mindful of its wider obligations to the environment. If we didn't have proper investment in our water infrastructure um, and the quality of our drinking water declined as a result, I'm sure Jackie Bailey would be one of the first uh, pointing fingers at this government. So we'll continue to take the responsible decisions, presiding officer, on this issue uh, across the range of other ways we are supporting people through the cost of living crisis. Uh, the actions and the decisions of this government uh, that continues to see us retain very high levels of trust from the Scottish people. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. Richard Hughes, chair of the Office for Budget Responsibility, has said that the last three Westminster Tory government's fiscal policy U-turns have cost taxpayers more than £40 billion of extra debt in just six months. That's £600 for every man, woman and child in the UK and 2,000 times the estimated cost of an independence referendum that the Tories keep moaning about. <laughs> Does the First Minister believe it's acceptable for the people of Scotland to continue paying the price of Westminster's economic incompetence? First Minister. No, uh, no it's not acceptable. The, the cost of Tory uh, fiscal an economic in incompetence epitomised in the disastrous decisions in the mini-budget. Remember uh, the decisions that initially the Conservatives here in yeah. Scotland wanted this yeah. government yeah. to replicate. Uh, those decisions, coupled of course uh, with the disaster of Brexit that unfolds on a daily yeah. basis, the cost of all of that has been paid by individuals, businesses and households right across Scotland right now. Um, there is an alternative to that uh, and it is to make this parliament responsible uh, for the decisions uh, that are so badly being so badly mishandled at, at Westminster. Uh, and I think uh, there is a growing desire on the part of people of Scotland to become independent and to build a much better alternative uh, to what we have right now. Yeah. Donald Cameron. Uh, at, at the weekend, the Sunday Post revealed that in the last 15 years, almost £100 million has been spent on short-term repairs to the 83 rest and be thankful. Meanwhile, communities across Argyll remain exasperated by the lack of action since Transport Scotland announced its preferred permanent route last year. Will the First Minister now instruct Transport Scotland to select this route and make it a top priority to deliver and end, once and for all, the misery that closures of this road cause? First Minister. Well, I'm, I'm assuming the member is not suggesting uh, that the investments in temporary repairs uh, shouldn't uh, have been made. That would be my first point. Secondly, uh, as I'm sure uh, the member uh, knows in relation to the rest and be thankful, a preferred route corridor for a permanent solution was uh, announced back in 2021. Route option designs within the preferred corridor are being progressed and we're working towards announcing a preferred route for the long-term solution by spring next year. Foyal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of the tragic death of Aov Ishak in Rochdale due to mouldy housing. 
I currently have constituents contacting me about issues with uh, mold and substandard temporary housing which could pose a similar threat to human life, particularly for small children. This issue seems alarmingly common across the local authority boundaries in a variety of different housing stocks. What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that similar tragedies are not going to happen in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government continues uh, to invest significantly in housing, both in terms of our target for new affordable housing, but also, uh, as the member uh, alludes to, uh, our existing housing stock. I will ask the Cabinet Secretary to write to the member in more detail about the actions we are taking and any uh, lessons uh, that do require to be learned here in Scotland from the very tragic case uh, that the member has highlighted today. Julian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, we saw the very welcome ruling from the Supreme Court on the Safe Access Zones Bill in Northern Ireland. The judgment was unanimous and unequivocal, and I believe gives a clear way forward for safe access zones here in Scotland. Would the First Minister join me in congratulating Claire Bailey and her team on this victory? And would the First Minister give her response to the ruling and what she believes this now means for Scotland? First Minister. Uh, firstly, I would congratulate Claire Bailey, but also thank her uh, for the advice she has offered to the Scottish Government. She attended the summit uh, that uh, we held earlier this year and that Gillian Mackay uh, also attended. Uh, I was very pleased yesterday to see that the Supreme Court has protected the rights of women to access abortion services without fear of harassment or intimidation in Northern Ireland. Uh, the Scottish Government is currently uh, considering very carefully uh, the detail of that judgment and we look forward to working with Gillian Mackay on how we can progress uh, quickly the next steps for taking her bill forward. Uh, we are absolutely committed to supporting Gillian Mackay with the development of a bill to safeguard access for women in Scotland to access healthcare facilities that provide abortion services and to do so without fear, harassment or intimidation. Natalie Dawn. Recent analysis from Citizens Advice Scotland has found that half of Scots are being forced to cut back on household spending. The main levers to address this crisis reside in Westminster, an institution which cannot be trusted to concern itself with the plight of ordinary people. Can I ask the First Minister what conversations she has had with the Prime Minister regarding the inadequacy of the UK Government response to the crisis that they created? First Minister. When I met with the Prime Minister um, a couple of weeks ago, I urged him, um, as the Scottish Government does more generally uh, on a regular basis, to take more action to help people uh, who are really struggling with the basic necessities of life because of this cost of living crisis. It continues to affect the livelihoods and the lives and increasingly the health and well-being of people across the country. Uh, the key policy levers are held by the UK Government, so we will continue to press them to use all levers at its disposal to tackle this emergency. That includes uh, access to borrowing, providing uh, benefits and support to households. But we will also continue to take action uh, ourselves. Uh, we've allocated almost three billion in this financial year to help. Um, and of course, we have increased the Scottish child payment uh, by 150% in less than eight months to 25 pounds per eligible child per week. Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Rhys Bonner is described as a gentle giant by his mum, Steph. He was found dead in Marshland in Glasgow in 2019. Police Scotland said his death was fully investigated, but his family disagree. In the last week, three and a half years since losing her son, some of Steph's complaints were upheld, with Perk asking Police Scotland to conduct new inquiries and provide more information. Steph tells me she is tormented by a process she describes as cruel. First Minister, it's been two years since the Angelini report laid bare the SNP's broken police complaint system. How many more families have to suffer before you or your Justice Secretary fixes it? First Minister. Um, in terms of the police complaint system, of course, uh, we are uh, taking forward recommendations from the Angelini uh, report and indeed uh, will legislate uh, in respect uh, of those recommendations. Uh, in terms of the specific case, it, it wouldn't be uh, right or appropriate for me to comment in detail on that. But of course, uh, the police uh, are expected to respond uh, to any uh, recommendations or actions that they're instructed to take uh, by PERC. And I would expect that to be the case uh, here. But that broader uh, reform of the complaint system uh, is ongoing and underway. And the Justice Secretary will keep Parliament updated as appropriate. Jamie Green. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The BBC reported this week that the backlog of community payback orders has reached 700,000. That's on top of the quarter of a million that were written off during the pandemic. The Justice Secretary told the BBC that this was pretty much business as usual. With respect, First Minister, if you're a victim of crime, this is anything but business as usual. And that includes a domestic abuse victim who saw her offender walk free from court with unpaid hours as his sentence. She was punched in the face, she was chucked through a glass door, and she is scarred and traumatised for life. The justice system is letting people down, it is letting women down, and community payback orders are not even being served, First Minister. When will this end, and when will the community justice system actually serve justice for victims of crime? First Minister. Firstly, Presiding Officer, obviously uh, the, the kind of individual cases uh, that Jamie Green has narrated uh, you know, are, are always uh, difficult and unacceptable for the individuals uh, concerned. Uh, more generally, however, as I often say here, because it is absolutely right that I do so, uh, court decisions are for courts and it is not uh, for ministers uh, or any politicians uh, to intervene in decisions of our justice system where a community payback order is issued, of course, uh, the offender has to serve uh, that community payback uh, order and that remains the case. More generally, of course, our community justice system uh, performs well, um, which will be one of the reasons why we continue to see uh, levels of crime in this country at historically low uh, levels and re-offending rates reduce as well. Uh, we continue to support the justice system to recover uh, from the pandemic and to catch up on backlogs uh, in all different aspects of the system. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. <clears throat> Point of order, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'd like to seek your guidance on the procedures surrounding the correcting of the official report. I have here a letter that I received last night from Sir Robert Choate, who is the chair of the UK Statistics Authority. After I alerted the authority, it, was the, it has investigated the SNP and Green government's claim that Scotland has 25% of Europe's potential offshore wind resource. Sir Robert confirms that these figures are in fact a mashup of several different studies that are more than 20 years old. He confirms that the Scottish government's calculations exclude countries like Norway, Sweden and Finland, which have large offshore wind potential. And he confirms that the figures give an inflated picture and were always inaccurate. The letter specifically says, and I quote, on 15th November, the Minister for Green Skills, Circular Economy and Biodiversity, Lorna Slater, Scottish Greens, acknowledged in Holyrood that the figure was outdated, but not that it was poorly constructed. In other words, it was never true. And it is time for the SNP and Greens to give up the spin and admit that. The First Minister's spokespeople still insist that it was, and I quote, calculated accurately at the time. Not true. Um, Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero, has even written to me this morning to say the figure is dated, not true. And it is still on SNP leaflets going through people's doors. The authority is now contacting the Scottish National Party and a number of nationalist parliamentarians directly about this. Now, I fully support the expansion of Scotland's renewable sector. I can't believe that Michael Matheson is actually leaving the chamber at this stage, presiding officer. I, I find that very disrespectful. I fully support the expansion of Scotland's renewable sector, but the strong case for that is undermined when the Scottish Government, and the SNP in particular, use figures that are completely fictitious. This, government's guidance, sorry, this Parliament's guidance states that corrections can only be accepted within 20 working days. Can I therefore seek your guidance on whether you have been approached by Lorna Slater, presiding officer, about her statement to Parliament on the 15th of November? Do you, presiding officer, expect a correction to be lodged before the 20-day deadline expires next Tuesday? Because I am concerned that Parliament has been misled. Thank, I, 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 can I re respond to Mr. Cole, Cole Hamilton? Um, it is of paramount importance that members, including ministers, give accurate and truthful information to the Parliament, correcting any errors at the earliest opportunity. If a member has a question about the factual accuracy of another member's contribution, they should raise it with that member. The Chamber and the member will be aware that the Parliament has previously agreed a corrections mechanism and how that mechanism operates. To answer your question, I have not 
been approached by the Minister, but it is entirely a matter for members to decide whether and how to use the corrections procedure. First Minister. Further point of order to that, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, as Ministers have said, uh, that figure is uh, no longer appropriate to use because it is out of date. But let me think, I, I think Alex Cole... I think Alex Cole Hamilton uh, would want me to put a complete picture before this chamber. Uh, so there are statements that he didn't include in his point of order. I'll give two. Uh, Scotland has a major role to play in this with an estimated 25% of Europe's offshore wind potential. That was a statement from uh, Lib Dem Minister Michael oh. Moore. Um, or secondly, we have more offshore wind power than the rest of the world combined. That was Lib Dem leader Vince Cable. Oh. Uh, so if it is the case that Alec Cole Hamilton um, is so distressed at the use of that figure by Scottish Government Ministers, perhaps in the interest of completeness, uh, he would also refer to his own colleagues who used exactly the same figure. The fact of the matter is, we have massive renewable potential and that is what Alec Cole Hamilton doesn't Thank like. Thank you, First Minister. That was not a point of order. Your comments are, however, on the record. Point of order, Alex Cole Hamilton. Order. Um, I seek your clarification around correction of the official report um, because I believe the First Minister has once again trotted out the suggestion that whilst that statistic is, no, which he, in her words, no longer accurate, Presiding Officer, the UK Statistical Authority wrote to me yesterday to say that it was never accurate, and frankly, I find that broadside attack on me personally beneath her. Mr Cole Hamilton, I have responded to your point of order. I have made it quite clear and members should make themselves aware as to how the corrections mechanism operates. Thank you. We will shortly move on to members' business.